And I'd like to welcome you to the Cleveland International Film Festival, Film Slam Streams, Post-Film Conversation for Foal. I am thrilled to be joined today by our special guest. Our special guest is Jeremy Kant. He's the director of the film Foal. Jeremy, hello and welcome. Hello, nice, nice to see you. Oh, great, good to see you too. And uh, you're not here in the United States. Where, where are you coming from right now? I'm in Montreal, Canada. Montreal, great, great. So great, good that you can join us. Let's get right into it, Fo. Academy um, Award a nominee film, nominated uh, for an Oscar. That's great, congratulations for that. Oh, thank um, you. A lot of people say it's just an honor just to be nominated. <laughs> so it is oh, quite an honor. So that's great. Outstanding work here. Tell us a little bit about what inspired you to create this film? Did you just wake up one day and say, hey, I'm going to make an Academy uh, Oscar nominated <laughs> film? <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's, it's a long story. It comes from so far, actually, because I grew up in the countryside of, of Quebec. And uh, later in my life, I just came back to that dream I had of sinking in quicksand. And just brought me back to that childhood where I used to pull pranks with my best friend. We used to explore the woods. And uh, I just thought to myself, what if actually an accident would have happened during those times when we were kind of like uh, pulling pranks at each other and mixing that element of, of dream that I had too at the same time, which was sinking in quicksand. So those two elements came together for both. Uh, and I decided to make a, a short film about it. Uh, interesting. So um, in terms of uh, making a film, the two boys, are those boys that you knew, or did you have a, a casting call to um, cast the film? Uh, actually, we we started casting uh, kids in Montreal at first, but we felt um, for the energy of the film, the kids were a bit too proper in parenthesis. It was just too clean. So we decided to go to the countryside and then uh, we reached out to school around the area where we're shooting and we saw more than I think 50 kids there and really uh, it was so inspiring because we just the interviews and improvisation with them. And that's how we found that our two main actors, uh, Felix and Alexandre, they're just so natural, you know, they're like so charismatic. Um, and they really uh, brought a lot of ideas for the film too, you know, like um, just they were telling me how they would say this line and what they would do. And so it was very collaborative uh, at the end. Well, good. Yeah, the boys had a really good chemistry. Uh, you actually believe that they were um, friends um, in, in okay. real life. Um, well, with the, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the production process itself. Um, costume design, um, that was intentional. Tyler did not have a shirt on. The other young man had orange and brown and blue on. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was, it was interesting because that, um, it, it was pretty difficult actually to find clothes for kids. Um, so we actually had to uh, to design the clothes very specifically. And, and I knew that I wanted Tyler to be shirtless because there's this kind of vulnerability to him having no shirt and being like immersed in nature and just having his skin tone against against nature. And there's something almost kind of very raw to it, almost primitive. And then on the side of, of, of Alex uh, Benjamin, there's this important connection too with with orange with the color full the burnt kind of orange so we actually had to dye shirts and like we did a lot of testing to find the right color of orange and uh when we actually found it with the custom designer then we made it up and we had to do a lot of replica of the same costumes because it's called reset but like when the kids go in the in the quicksand the clothes are ruined so you need to have a few of the same clothes for reset so we made a lot of those clothes, I think like seven or eight times so we could actually do the to the take another time quickly. Oh, interesting. Very, very, very interesting uh, way of um, getting some behind the scenes information. Uh, yeah. uh, looking at the story itself, um, I know before we started this conversation, we had a free conversation. And uh, can you tell, um, share with our audience what you shared with me about the um, the title of the film, Fove, and um, you know some of the meanings that you were trying to um, express in the film. Yeah, totally. So, Fove is a 
French word, and it was very hard to translate to English because it means many things in French. Uh, first of all, it's uh, it translates to wild beast or wild cats, um, and that like is kind of reflected in the, in the energy of the two boys. Then also is that color, right? That burnt orange brown that you can probably make some links or what it means. And then finally, it's also an art current called Fauvism. And Fauvism was like those, those beautiful paintings of landscapes that in the countryside, they were very vivid. Um, and kind of like inspired me for the, the actual ending of the film um, where, where the fox is there and, and um, we have uh, a Tyler looking, looking at him and being emotional, so yeah. Okay, Leah. Let's let's now that you mentioned the ending, let's talk about the ending. <laughs> well, what? <laughs> I, I, um, what did you want um, people to uh, come away um, from with the ending of the film? What did you want people to think? I have my own opinion. I'm sure students. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's super interesting, and I feel that's always the artist question because when you you make a film at the end it belongs to the audience right and everybody makes their, their own opinion of it and for me it was really ending ending to a lot a lot of ideas but at the end what you take out of, out of it is so important to yourself but what i can say about it is that sometimes in life i feel there are coincidences that are too special to be just simple coincidences there's something else out there that Kind of like almost, we can call it the calling signs, you can call it karma, you can call it God, but there's this idea of almost it tries to say something at you and you, you interpret it the way you want to interpret it. But for me, it was important that there's a moment where something was, this was almost talking to, to Tyler at the end. Okay. But I don't know what, what I don't know what, you, what you're thinking. Tell me what you're thinking. I will in one moment because I have a, we have a question from a, a, a student and uh, it fits in right now. And uh, okay. the question is, uh, what does a fox represent and why a fox? Yeah, I mean, I, I, fox are always been it's like such mythical creatures, right? And um, I grew up in the countryside and I would see fox sometimes just like roaming around and it would be just so magical every time I would see a fox. Um, and they're very clever. And we know we say like in French, on um, so there's this idea that really connects strongly with Benjamin, of course, and what, what is wearing and there's that, that, that strong connection there. Um, and you know, in the beginning of the film, he sees a fox, but uh, Tyler doesn't see the fox, so there's, and we don't really see it ourselves too, so what can we really believe or not? So I just wanted to raise a lot of questions with the fox for you to make your own interpretation of it. Exactly, that, that's what I, I thought too. I'll, I'll give you my interpretation of the ending nice. uh, as I look at all these questions coming out, I don't want to steal their thunder, but um, the game the boys were playing in the beginning, um, yeah trying to, is, is there a specific name for that game that they were playing i i know there's, there's they, they, there was a point system like the first to get to six basically but uh no specific uh name. right it is exactly so i figure the way you ended it was um benjamin was saying that he won <laughs> but, you know i'm the fox now i'm the sly fox i won i'm okay and you could That's the good. way you had Tyler smirk kind of at the end, you know, it gave some type of um healing moment to the film in which it wasn't too somber. You know, you had the somber moment take place shortly before the end, and we were just feeling what Tyler was feeling and at the end we mm -hmm. can feel what he feels. So that was oh, a little interpretation there. That's, sure that's good. It. That's good though. I like that. The first time I think I hear this about the the, the point system that and that's super great because I think at the end, that's what it is too. It's like, there's always hope, you know, too, in, in this world. And there's always a way, even though it's very tragic what happened, there's just some light, you know, and, and it's beautiful how you see it with the, with the point system that like, it's almost they even, it's, 
it, it even itself out at the end, you know, it's about, it's about them at the end, you know? It, exactly. It was, you came full circle with that. I, I that worked out really well. Uh, I'm going to um, turn it, I'm going to go to some of our questions now. We have a number of questions coming out. I just want to keep on encouraging yeah. students to put questions in the Q&A. Uh, one question was, um, is, um, was there any symbolism with the truck? What was the intent of being, of it being found empty? Yeah. Um, so basically, you know, the truck is what drives them to go in, into the mine. Um, because they're afraid of, of adults, you know, they're, they're afraid of consequences of being in the place they should be. At the end of the day, um, when they're actually going to ask for help, then they're alone. It's, it's really that, that world of kids, you know, it's really like, um, there's really nobody else that can be there for them. And it's almost like, it's like on a deeper level, I guess, like what it meant is like the, all the industrial, and this, it's like nature vs human at the end, right? It's a, it's a film about that. So we have like all the truck and the old like abandoned kind of structures. It, it's all like representative of like human activity. On the other end, we have like really the kids being very vulnerable in that grandiose nature that that is very strong and powerful, you know. And it's almost like like that that metaphor of like men men forgot a bit this, this place at one point, you know, it's just like, and the kids are really like, almost like in some ways like animals, like it's very raw, it's very primitive. So um, it's it's really that that symbol of men versus uh, nature. Interesting, very interesting. We have another question coming in. <laughs> this person, I think they've um, uh, picking up the whole Titanic, Titanic theme, why Rose didn't save Jack. So this person wants to know, uh, what do you think about the idea of Tyler driving the giant dump truck down the hill to save Benjamin? Oh, that's that's interesting. I've never thought of that. Uh, I mean, that that could have been great. I just feel like for 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 uh, Tyler, it is it is a hard thing. I mean, to just find like it's just so complicated, right? To 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 drive that truck, but it is like something that at the end you could have tried out. It could have been a, a, a thing, yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, okay. Uh, I know we talked about interpreting the own ending. One person wants to know, did Benjamin survive? I don't think he did based on the way you did it, but does he survive? I mean, that's an, another interpretation too. Who knows, you know, if you want to believe in your heart that he survived, like at the end, I think like in life, we don't get all answers, all the answers we want sometimes. And it's, it's, it's good to find your own. And it, it might have like in the parallel story, maybe survive and find its way out in one way or another. Yeah. Right. So it's possible that, you know, Benjamin did um, li yeah. live. And um, one student said that it's possible. It was wondering if he lived. And um, also um, this person loved the film, by the way. Um, and uh, another person was wondering, I know we talked about the dump truck uh, already, but they want, wonder where, where were the people that drove the dump truck? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, they, they can be, uh, <laughs> I mean, they can, there's, it can be a lot of things, right? Sometimes, like, those guys, like, because, you know, like, I spent so much time on those mines, I was actually close to the miners and, and the guys that were working there, so... For them, it's like uh, the backyard, right? So they're just, they park their truck, they can leave the door open, they can go, I don't know, go take a pee or like go smoke a cigarette, go on lunch break, just leave it there. They come back, you know, they do a bunch of stuff. It's very like, because um, it is all like protected by fence, they feel very free there. Um, so, and I think there's this element of like just having this truck that is just so powerful because like uh at first even i thought like i had like this i wanted in the film to have like this super um, um loud noise of the truck like running and stuff and and like have it like overpower like tyler screaming screaming for help and we really wanted in the in the frame too to have it like very powerful like taking a lot of place and like almost like um how you say it like um 
shrinking or like uh, putting a, a lot of weight on, on Tyler. But then we realized in, in, in the edit that just the fact that like Tyler was screaming and like the fact that he was silent and we could hear his voice very well already had like so much impact. Um, so I think it, it's that duality, uh, we wanted to express that with the images. Um, so it's almost like because he's a kid, it's, it is too hard for, for him to actually reach reach for help and go into truck and go even higher. Like he's jumping, like he's not even, like it's difficult, you know, everything seems like uh, uh, too far, like too difficult uh, to access for him because he's a, he's a child and not an adult. Right, it, it, exactly. And, um... And, and, and just the vastness and the openness of the space, I, I enjoyed the way you use that, having the boys wandering around. I'm sure a lot of students watching this could see themselves in the film. You ever just wander around, just don't know what you're going to get into next. And uh, uh, next question comes in from someone that wants to know, um, where's the countryside? What is the countryside like? Where, where did you grow up? Uh, I guess they're asking, is the countryside where you shot similar to a place where you grew up or were you familiar with that area? Uh, like the actual area where we shot is different than like where I grew up. Um, but it, it is inspired by my childhood because, because I grew up in nature, like the closest home was like four kilometers away from my home. And they, there used to be a lot of like construction in the forest and like, uh, it's kind of like small mines. Um, and a lot of abandoned cars and stuff like that we would play with so i was really inspired by that time but we found this location that was very like so interesting because it was really like a lunar almost like a, we're on the moon you know and it, it was so like just the color of it and like it's very it was just so dreamy too and i knew about that area because there's been a lot of digging there so i, I scouted i think like 10 or 12 those mines and they're all too small and then I, that was the last one actually and, and when I, I found it I was so excited I was like oh my god like this fits perfectly with the film so um and that's where we found right beside it there were actually abandoned trains there so at first the kids were playing with abandoned cars but then they were there up in the train so I was like this is even better for the film that actually they're playing with those trains so like the story changed then when we found the location. Okay, well, great. It was a great location. And just for those people who are, you know, may, maybe a little sensitive uh, about, you know, the tragedy in the film, can you just tell us a little bit how you um, did the quick sand scenes? And, you know, obviously he didn't, you know, of course, of quick course. Sand. Go, what, what, of course. what did you do? <laughs> of course, so that was a lot, a lot of research. Like, you know, we have like a visual effects supervisor, uh, that's on set with us. We have a stunt coordinator that's on set with us. We have a medic. So it's a very controlled environment. Um, so the way we did it actually is that the visual effects supervisor dig the hole uh, that they, they fortify with wood and they actually filled it with oatmeal. Uh, so it's very soft. It's very comfortable for the actors. And then we put, it's, it's a hydraulic platform. So they could, could stand on it and like we push a button and like it goes down. But we realized that like it was never very useful that hydraulic platform because just the thickness of the oatmeal was already kind of creating that effect. And of course, like the the depth of it is not like it gets to you know the half half of half of the length of the kid. So he needed at the end to kind of go a bit of an, on his knees to kind of fake for it to go to to his neck. And and yeah, so then we had like uh, people like helping in and out doing the resets. But we realized that what was actually more dangerous in some ways is that it was a very cold summer. And after every take, we're taking a temperature of, of the kid and of, of Alex Alman, and he, his temperature was going lower and lower because he was getting cold there. So at one point we had to stop and split it in two days so it wouldn't get too cold. Interesting, interesting. It's just yeah. the, the marvel, the marvel of making films and special effects. Great. I, yeah. I, I know um, 
I know we're running up against our time here. For those um, people who are expecting only 20 minutes, um, we're going to go a little longer. We have so many questions. We're going to go about five minutes or so a little longer. But if your class is over with and you do have to move on, um, this is being recorded. So you can um, catch this later on and, um, and find out more answers to your questions. OK, moving on. Uh, well, another student wants to know, was there any symbolism with Tyler Stick? Yeah, the stick, uh, yeah, that's that's an important object too. That's a good question. Because um, in the beginning of the film, you know, he, he has this this idea, he wants to do a prank with this, this stick. He finds a stick and then he's being pranked on by Benjamin kind of faking his dead. And that's the, the premonition of the film. So like the stick that at first he wanted to kind of not be mean, but like do a kind of a joke with it at the end, he used, he tried to use it to save his friend. So the stick, the, the meaning of the stick changes through, throughout the film. So I found that interesting that he just carries it over until then. But it's like, and that's also an element of nature that, that's in there, but that cannot really help. Okay, good, very good. Uh, someone else wants to know, um, is there a backstory to why Tyler hasn't seen his dad? Yeah, I mean, like I always imagine Tyler having a dad that's like a, a trucker and that's like on the road a lot. And uh, it's a lot inspired by my friends at the time um, and like their surrounding and the kind of friends I was in with when I was younger. And they were like, they didn't have really a father presence with them. So um, they would have to prove a lot. And sometimes they, they would push themselves a lot because they, they were kind of trying to fill a void um, that like the, the, the father didn't really have. So I wanted to kind of represent that with Tyler and kind of touch a bit on it. Okay, very good, very, 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 very good. Uh, this is another interesting question was um, about the ending of the film. Is there um, anything else you would have put at the end? How would you have extended this film? to even make it longer? I guess, what other elements would you have put in it? <laughs> Ooh, that's difficult, because I really saw it like this as a short film, and even like with the success that it, it got, like there's like, it could have been good for me to try to transform it into a feature film, and that's something I don't want to do because I feel it just works so good as a short film. Um, and I think the open ending is what makes it great too. But I, I'm kind of working on two scripts right now where one I've been pretty much, I'm pretty done writing, but the, the new one that I'm writing is kind of taking place in the countryside and kind of there's some elements of folk too in it. Um, so I think I want to kind of rethink that energy and that tone and put it in, in the next films. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, another question was, um, this is a good one. Uh, was there any connection between Benjamin pretending to be locked in a train car and him sinking into the quicksand? Were you trying to do a foreshadowing there? There's a, there's a bit of that in the film, I think. And that's a that's super good observation because um, that element of fe feeling trapped, I feel, just relate to the feeling of anxiety where you feel there's just no escape from it, you know, and that's ultimately, uh, I think, a big theme of the film. Um, even if, like, nature is super big and everything, and it seems there's so much space, then, like, you're stuck in your head and you cannot do much about it. Um, so I don't know if it, if it was a conscious choice for me, but, like, in terms of, of like, emotion, I probably just to try to link and make the film stronger together. Oh, good. Very good. Uh Another question, oh, how has um, being nominated for an Oscar changed your life? And I'm going to throw this in. Did you attend the <laughs> uh, Academy Awards? And what was that like if you did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was wonderful. I mean, it's, it's a real dream come true since I'm so young. Um, I mean, I look up to, to the Oscars and it was a real honor to, to be able to attend and be there. And, and now I'm an Academy member. So, you know, I, I'm... I receive films every year and, and I vote. So just this whole process is, um, it just, I, I, it teaches me a lot of things. I learn a lot and I feel very privileged. So 
that that's been that's been great um i don't know if it's changed i mean it's always important i think like to just focus on creativity and, and focus on continuing on on writing and i don't i don't really know the impact really yet um i like i think it, it open door for sure there's more people interested and there are more people like um ready to support me so i feel very grateful for that um but i i don't i didn't change my life completely too you know so <laughs> the same completely the same too so I see. I see. Okay, we're going to bring this to a close, but I just want to ask us, uh, I'm combining a couple of questions from a student okay. and a, a teacher, I guess she's asking for her class as well, is um, uh, what inspired you to chase your dreams and I guess be, to become a film director? Yeah, I mean, it, it started when I was pretty young, when I was like around 11, 12, I did like a theater um, play at the time and I, I just fell in love with like telling stories and um, I, f I feel like making films is just gives you just so many opportunities to talk about so many subjects and explore a lot of, of different things and just such a great form of expression and I, I just fell in love with the medium of, for what I can give you so I think everything is possible even if it seems very difficult I think if you really have a passion for something and really push in the direction like great things gonna happen so I, I think like it's really that passion for cinema that that drove me here. Great, great. It's a, it's very important to follow your dreams. And um, the last question before I let you go, you touched upon on something you're working on now. Can you tell us a little bit, bit more about that and when we can expect to see your next project? Yeah. Um, so I've been writing, co-writing my first feature film. It's it's happening in. Quebec and Canada, and it's a parallel story between Quebec and Ghana in West Africa. And I've been co-writing with uh, a Ghanaian filmmaker from there, and we became super close friends. And it's just, it's a coming of age between those two countries, and there's something that kind of connects them together. Okay, great, great. Yeah. Well, I, I wish you all the best with that. We look forward to uh, seeing uh, that and many more projects for, for, from you. And, Thank you so um, much. Yeah, you're quite welcome. And we want to um, thank our studio student audience for joining us for this invigorating and important conversation. Uh, for more information about the 45th Cleveland International Film Festival, please continue to follow CIFF on social media and visit clevelandfilm.org. Thank you all. I'm Eric Seiler. <laughs>